All right. So welcome uh, to the presentation about Windsor chairs and just a few things about the presentation. Um, it's not my intent that you're going to come here and learn how to build Windsor chairs. But what I'm hoping that you get out of the presentation are some really critical um, factors about building Windsor chairs. Um, when speaking with Michelle earlier, her interest in early American things uh, and Windsor chairs being one of them, there's a reason why um, chairs that were built in the 1700s are still around and in use today. Um, and we're going to talk about some of that stuff, and it's what I try to incorporate um, into my presentation. Okay, so first of all, a little bit about me, um, Fitchburg State graduate. I was an industrial arts teacher. Um, I had some woodworking experience at, at school, but not a lot. But it wasn't until I began teaching that I really had an opportunity to dive into woodworking. Um, when I got married, I went to Williamsburg for a honeymoon. Uh, my wife and I, and I saw um, in the furniture shop they were building a Windsor chair, and I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It's fantastic. So when I came home, um, that was in June, I found a book that had been recently um, published by Michael Dunbar, who lives in New Hampshire, originally from Worcester, um, and it was a, a book full of information about building Windsor chairs. So I bought the book, and for a couple of months, tried to do what the book suggested. And uh, my hope was to build my wife a Windsor chair for Christmas. So Christmas Eve, I got it done. <laughs> and um, it, was, it was a horror show. Um, it was a chair like this. It, in this chair, I should introduce the chairs too. This is a continuous arm Windsor chair. Continuous arm. One board compound then. Continuous arm. This is a comb back chair, um, also called a Philadelphia high chair, and this is called a sack back Windsor. We'll talk about this shortly. This is not a Windsor. Um, so, but that, that first Windsor chair that I built, I, I ended up making eight backs um, because they kept breaking, and I couldn't understand why. I was doing what, I, I thought I was doing what I was reading about, but I've learned an awful lot since, um, and I know where I was making my mistake now. But um, <clears throat> that was the first chair. That chair is in use. We use it all the time. It's at our computer. My kids grew up on that chair, you know, doing their homework and stuff. Uh, it, it's gotten tons of use. Um, there's nothing loose on it. Uh, it just isn't, it just doesn't look that good. But that's okay. It was my first chair. All right. So Windsor chairs, I'm often asked, what makes a Windsor chair a Windsor chair? Uh, and I would say that the chairs that you're sitting in, they're Windsor chairs. Interesting. Um, Windsor chairs, typically, the seat is sort of what informs us whether it's, not a, a, whether it's a Windsor chair or not. In other words, the seat on Windsor chairs, the legs stop at the seat. The back begins at the seat. So all these chairs, you can see that the legs go into the seat, terminate, and the back, whatever shape the back is, begins at the seat and goes up. I brought this chair because this is, I'm going to say more like ladder back or shaker style chair, and you can see the back is the rear leg. Um, and that's really the difference. There's a lot of similarities between this chair and all the Windsor chairs in terms of how it's constructed, um, but in terms of you know, how we define Windsor chairs, there is a difference. So <coughs> my Windsor chairs, and, and chair makers will do it differently, but my Windsor chairs uh, almost always consist of three species of wood. I have pine for the seat, and I chose or choose pine for the seat because on all my chairs, you can see, hopefully you can see with the right light, that the seat is saddled or it's sculpted. And pine is a, is a wood that's relatively easy to sculpt. Uh, another wood would be butternut, uh, poplar. Basswood would be a good wood to choose. Um, but I, I typically use pine, and I buy pine 
Um, boards like this, 18 to 20 inches wide. I don't want any knots. Um, and the, the biggest struggle I have is finding this wood because it's difficult to find. So when I can find, you know, a supply of it, I typically buy the supply and I'll have it, you know, I, I'll have it for 10 years and go through it and then I have to go hunting again for more pine. The other wood that we use or I use is sugar maple uh, or hard maple. And I use hard maple for any piece on my chair that's turned on the lathe. So the legs are all turned on the lathe. My arm posts are turned on the lathe. Um, and sugar maple is just, it's, it's a great wood uh, to turn with, especially green. And when I refer to green wood, I'm talking about wood with freshly cut, very high moisture content. Um, so maple is a great wood to turn. Uh, and then once it, once it dries, it is very hard and very, you know, very durable. The other wood that I use um, on almost all of my chairs will be red oak or white oak. And that's what I want to start talking about. So um, all the wood, other than wood for the seat, um, comes from a log. So I buy my logs, most recently I buy logs in a, in a small mill in New Hampshire. And uh, the last log I bought, I was showing Tom a picture, it's about a 19 inch diameter. Um, I cut it to just a little bit over seven feet, um, just so I could fit it into the truck. Um, and that's what this piece came out of. Um, so as soon as I get a log home, um, I split the log open because I never know what I'm going to get inside the log. I mean, I, I've learned to um, analyze the bark, and you can tell a lot from the bark. But uh, until you open it up, you really never know everything that's there. So I'll split the log in half. And that's just with a maul uh, and a wedge or wedges. Um, I typically quarter the log. And then I'll start working on it with um, a little more care. You know, because with a maul and a, and a wedge, all I'm doing is sticking it in and in and you're slamming it. You're hitting it as hard as you can. And, and, and the crack is going to go where the crack goes. But typically, it's going to split along the grain. Um, but once I get it worked down a bit, I'm able to, um, I, I want you to imagine this piece twice this thickness. And um, it's stuck right now into a sort of a fork. I've got a couple of trees held up. And there's, there's a bit of a fork. So this goes into the fork. I take my fro, and I can bang on this fro, and it'll, it'll start to go into the wood. And then I can pry very carefully, and I'm able to split along the grain. So I'll try to demonstrate that. I don't really have a way to um, hold the wood other than in my, you know, my feet here, but you'll get the idea if I can do this. So again, just imagine this is a much bigger piece. I'm trying to split this or start a crack right in the middle. Now that 25 years old, 25 years old, and it's just about time that we do a new one. That was that's a piece of sugar maple, and you know banging like that for 25 years, and you know that's really that's really done quite well. So I call it now my split right here isn't going to split right down the middle. But you can hear where I'm, I'm not using the fro as a wedge. I'm using the fro just to get some leverage. And you can hear it. I call it unzipping the grain. And it's really important that we try to unzip the grain carefully just let me get through this. Okay. And again, that split right along what's called the radial plane. Okay? And you can look at that. And, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of a curve here. 
it's split along the radial plane. It's got a curve in it because trees, although they might look straight when you're looking across the yard, they're not straight. Um, but once I have this split along the radial plane, I have I'm, half the battle is, is there. And when I say radial plane, hello. hello. I'm just going to wet this so we can see it a little better. Okay, so radial plane, think of this, here's, you know, as we've all looked at the stump, right, with all the, all the annual rings. So here's the bark, here's the center of the tree, all right? And I want to show you two things. One is the radial plane, or the rays, and the other is what we would call the annual ring. So the annual rings are running this way. Yep. You can see those white rays? Okay. All right, so very important. The rays are running this way, the annual rings are running this way. All right. So this piece here, whatever, four feet, five feet, was this, and we split it right along the radial plane. And again, it's not perfectly straight, but I have a, a roughly a flat surface. And from this, I can take tools like draw knives. I typically use a much bigger draw knife, but this is a nice one for these presentations. It's small. Um, I take a draw knife, I put this in a vise. It's usually too big for my shaving horse. And I'm able to draw a knife across here. And I, you know, anything that is curved will just follow that, but we'll smooth it out. Okay? So that's how we begin um, on our chair pots. What we're trying to do is avoid something called grain runout. All right? So this is just a piece of oak like that, just out of my shop. Uh, and, you know, I, I do a lot of cabinet work too uh, with machines and saws. So here's, I've marked the grain right here, and you can see where the grain is starting right there, and it's running right out to the edge. And if I turn it over this side, it's running out to the, the edge there. That's called grain runout, and that is going to weaken this piece of wood. Everything that we do in, in the type of chair building that I do, we, do not, we want no runout. Runout is, is, is trouble. We split everything, we don't saw anything. When we saw, the saw ignores the direction of the grain. So we split everything and we try to exploit, you know, the characteristics of the wood to get the strength that we need. So my fro again. I'll take this picture. Yeah. So I'm going to do a couple of things here, and I'm sitting on something called a shaving horse, and a shaving horse is nothing more than um, a device, um, we'll call it a vice. Uh, I can use my feet, put some pressure on this, and it will hold this relatively still so that I can have two hands on my draw knife, or if I'm using a spoke shave or another tool, um, and it's a, it's a it's a great way to um, do woodworking. So I'm going to do a couple of things here. I am going to follow the grain on one side. And on the other side, I'm going to cut across the grain. And when I say across the grain, I'm talking about layers of grain. All right. So. On this side, I have severed the grain. There's a layer, there's a layer, there's a layer. Yeah. On this side, I have followed all along one layer. Okay? We see, can we see this? I've severed the grain here, 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 here. I've cut, them, I've cut across the grain. Mm -hmm. Grain um, run out. Here, I've shaven all the way across one layer. All right. So here, I've cut across, or yeah. severed, layers of grain. Here, I've shaved all along one layer oh, of yeah. grain, okay? Yeah. 
So again, when I cut across the layers of grain, it's the same as my board with the marker on it, it's grain run out, and that's, a, that's not a good situation. We want, whenever possible, to shave along the grain. Patrick, when you do that, when you get the run out, does that cause it to, to splinter or to split? Um, it will definitely cause it to splinter or split. As it dries. Um, but when we bend it. You know, e but even before it dries. If it's, if it's still green, I always bend green. Um, and if I have severed the grain severely enough, I can almost guarantee when I bend, and we're going to bend a piece later on. Um, and I'll tell you right now that this morning I was working on that piece. I know the side that we're going to bend on, it, there is some slight. It's been severed slightly. I think it's a good enough piece of wood where it's going to hold, but we'll find out. Um, but it definitely weakens the wood anytime we sever those, the grain. So like spindles, I want my grain to run from the center of the spindle all the way up to the center at the top. Now certainly because my spindle is tapered, it's three quarters of an inch here, and by the time I get down here it's closer to three eighths of an inch, um, I had a, you know, you've got to taper that. So on, at some point we are severing the grain, but we do have grain running from the middle here all the way up right through the middle of this. Um, and, and when we do that, it allows us to have a very strong and flexible piece of wood. I mean, this is white oak. Um, it's strong. Uh, you're not going to break that. Um, and, and it's going to give. It's going to allow it to flex. I bring this chair because it's a great example of a chair that flexes. People are all different sizes. People sit down in chairs all different ways. Some people are very gentle. Some people are not gentle at all. And it puts an enormous amount of stress on the chair, depending on who's sitting in it and how they're sitting on it. But like this chair, long spindles, lots of flex, right? But we don't worry about that. I mean, I, I, you know, a big guy comes and sits with a lot of weight thrown backwards, okay, the chair is designed to give to that. If it's stiff, there's not going to be any give, uh, and we're going to have fractured parts. I've got a uh, client that he has, uh, he's in Jamaica Plain, he's a doctor, he's got some really nice furniture. And his dining room, he's got six nice dining room chairs. I have repaired three of the chairs. I now have saved all my patterns because I know it's only a matter of time I'm going to get the fourth, fifth, and sixth chair. <laughs> Every chair has broken the same way. It's the same area of the leg. It's the way it was designed. And, you know, it, it probably all came from relatively the, the same lo you know, lot of wood. And every, every one of it has grain run out. And that's where it's breaking. So, okay. So I use white oak, I've used red oak, but mostly now I use white oak. Ash is a good wood to use too. Um, a lot of colonial chairs, especially for spindles like on a, on a, on a chair like this, they would use hickory because hickory is that much stronger than um, white oak. Um, hickory is a great wood to use when it's green because it works very easily too, but once it's dry, it's really, it's tough. It's tough, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really good wood, and that's another reason why Windsor chairs made in the 1700s are still around today. Um, okay, maple. I purchased my maple logs just like um, the oak logs. The only difference is I typically just cut them to 26 or 24 inches uh, when I get home. I just cut them and I split it just like I'm splitting firewood because at this point I'm not using a fro, I'm just using a maul and uh, it's just like I'm making firewood. And what I do once I get it down split small enough, I just take it in and I zip off the corners um, and I throw it in my garage. So this piece of wood has been in the garage for several months. Um, it was, you know, soaking wet when I put it in there. The garage is, it's a cool place, it's not a dry place, 
Um, so the moisture content in this here, I'm going to guess it's probably around 15%. I haven't measured it. But in this part of the country, the northeast, when you're assembling furniture, you'd like, um, you know, the wood to be about 8%, 7%. When I build my chairs, and we'll get into this a little deeper in a while, um, I have pots that I call super dry. And I want my super dry pots to be, if I can get it less than 6%, that's what I want. I want it as dry, as bone dry as I can get it. So um, from this point, once I have it, you know, it's been sitting around for a while, I can put it on the lathe. I can put it on the lathe right away, but when the wood is too wet, it doesn't, burn, uh, doesn't turn quite as nice as when it's dried a little bit. So it'll go on the lathe. Um, and if you don't know what a lathe is, a lathe is um, it's just a, it's a machine. It'll hold this wood. I'm turning between centers. It'll hold it um, in this position. I got a motor here, just a, a, a drive here, and the wood spins. And there's a tool rest, and I'm working different tools uh, as this spins. I'm shaving away or cutting away. Get it round first, and then put whatever detail um, that you need. Um, I've turned quite a bit. Um, you know, every chair is, is four legs, it's, it's three stretches, it's, it's arm post if you have an arms on it. So I get a lot of practice turning. And now when I turn, I just, you know, a lot of it's by eye. And, you know, really, you're probably going to have a hard time telling if, if, you know, this piece is a sixteenth bigger than this piece when it's this far apart. And it really doesn't matter. Uh, I don't get hung up on it. They all having to be whatever this dimension is, you know, an inch and seven eighths. I don't get hung up on that. If one is an inch and seven eighths and one is an inch and fifteen sixteenths, who, who cares? Because nobody can tell. Um, when I turn chair legs, everything is done at one time except for the tenon. So this tenon right here is bigger than this tenon. It's bigger intentionally. So this is oversize. And we've got to remember that this, was, this is a green piece of wood. It still has a lot of moisture in it. The tenon is oversize. So once it's done being turned, I take this and I put it into what I call my kiln. And my kiln is just a, it's, I'm going to call it a box, just really made from um, solar, uh, not, foam board energy board, uh, insulation board, one inch, inch insulation board. And it's got three light bulbs in it. And with the light bulbs on, I can get the heat up in the box to be about 130 degrees. So I have a bunch of holes on top of the box, and the leg will sit in the hole like that. So about this much of the leg is inside the kiln, and it'll sit there for three or four days. And after three or four days, this portion is dry. And this is where I, I want it bone dry, as dry as I can get it. This portion I typically cover with tin foil because I don't want this portion to dry out. I only want my tenon to dry out. So once this is dry, I'm able to put it back onto the lathe and I'll true the tenon up. I'll make it, my tenon's a six degrees, a six degree taper. I'll, I'll uh, turn it exactly six degrees and and I'll get to this point, okay? But now this is perfectly dry, all right? I should have mentioned, as wood dries, it becomes not, it doesn't dry, I turned it round, but as it dries, it's not gonna stay round. It's because it's gonna dry more in the tangential plane than the radial plane, and therefore it's gonna be an oval. That's why it's turned oversize, because as it dries, it's gonna be an oval. I true it back up and to, get, to get it perfectly round again. All right, I'm going through all of this because this is a critical piece of, of um, Windsor chairs. So I talked about this being, or the leg being a six degree taper. And I want to introduce you to this little tool right here. All this is, is a, it's a piece of steel. It has a, an edge a sharpened edge on, on two sides. And when I say sharpened, it's just really ground, um, like on a 45 degree angle. It's not 
shop like a knife, but it's, it is ground on, a, on an angle. And two opposing sides. So when I take this reamer and I put it into a hole in my chair seats, I drill my legs at 5 8 So I drill a 5 8 hole, I put the reamer into the 5 8 hole and I begin to turn and pressure you know, down. I'm usually, this is usually clamped down and I have two hands on this using a fair amount of pressure. And what it's doing, it's grinding away the inside of the hole. So the hole was nice and straight on two sides, but after I use the reamer, the hole becomes tapered. And I got a six degree taper here, six degree taper here. I put the two together. I just have to grab my little hammer here. Okay. Okay. All right. Just feel how strong that is. Yeah. I mean, that's not going to go anywhere. Give it a good twist, Tom. Right? I mean, that's not going anywhere. And that's just a little wrap with the hammer, and it's really, it's a, you know, it's the tapered hole um, means everything here. Um, and in addition to that, when I'm in the assembly stage of my, my chairs, um, I drive a wedge. I don't know if you saw it, but that, that chair leg had a saw curve in it. So, once this is coming up through my seat, I take wedges and I drive a wedge down there. So what I have done um, is tape it, tape it whole, tape it chair leg, chair leg goes through, and when I drive the wedge, I'm, I'm actually flaring the end of that leg. So, and I put hide glue in there. So between all those things, the tapered joint, the wedge, and the glue, it's, it's typically not going to come apart. Now, wood is always moving. Really humid days in August. Really cold days um, in the, uh, the middle of the winter. The heat's on in the house. The house is very dry. So wood is always moving. It's expanding and it's contracting. So in some of my chairs, over a period of time, I might get a little, in fact, on this one, I can just feel the top of that leg just starting to, to poke through. Um, it's not loose, but what it's doing is it's a taper, and the more that chair gets used and the more that wood is expanding and contracting, contracting it's forcing the seat deeper and deeper onto the leg. I've never seen them go any more than probably an eighth of an inch, but it, it does happen on some of them. Um, so, all right. Can I just ask a question? Yeah, oh, ask all the questions you, you want. You're talking about 6% yes. dry. What kind of thing do you have to tell you that? Well, <clears throat> what you can do, uh, there's a couple things. There are meters out there. You can use a meter, digital meter, it'll tell you what it is. Um, they're really expensive, and I don't have one. I have borrowed some in the past when I needed to know specifically. But one thing that you can do, I know my cellar is very dry. So if I have wood, I can weigh the wood, record it every day, continue to record it until the wood no longer loses, uh, loses weight. Yeah. When it stops losing weight, I know that the wood is at the same moisture content as my cellar, which is super dry. So that's, a, that's a, probably the easiest way to, to explain it. And the more you do it, you can take, uh, especially when I'm building this type of chair, I take these rungs and I hit them together. Uh, when you first put them in the kiln, take two rungs, put, hit them together, it's going to be a thud, thud, thud. As that wood dries out over a period of days, the tone is going to change significantly. And it, it ends up being a fairly high ring to it 
and again, it's through experience, but I can tell, I can tell two pieces of wood which one has more moisture in it than another <coughs> when I'm at that stage. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we've talked about oak, and, and we've talked about how we need to uh, follow the grain, grain runout, um, avoid grain runout. We've talked about maple, turning the, the, the legs. I need to talk about how I start the seats. So what I typically do on my chairs is I, I make half patterns. And this pattern actually is for this chair. And it has all kinds of information on it. It's got these funky lines going everywhere. But, but they all mean something to me. And um, what I'll do is I'll just trace the pattern onto the wood, one half, then the other half. But I refer to the pattern because the pattern is telling me things like um, the angle on all these, all these chairs, all the chair legs, it's a compound angle. Uh, and it's a compound angle because when I look at it from the front, it's one angle. When I look at the, the chair leg from the side, it's another angle. And they're different. And it can get very confusing if you want a, you know, a 17 angle, a 17 degree angle from the front, but you want it to be a 24 degree angle from the side, and you're trying to do this with a couple of bevel squares, it's maddening. It's, it's very confusing, and it's, it's, it's a great chance to make a big mistake. So I try to minimize the confusion, and I do that by what I call sight lines. So this sight line right here, This sight line, as long as I hold my drill bit along that sight line, when I say along that sight line, I can, I'm just looking right down the drill bit and I've lined it up with this line. Okay? This is not lined up, this is not lined up, but this is lined up. As long as I drill along that sight line and I hold this angle along the sight line to whatever angle I've determined I needed, in this case it's 18 degrees, I hold this at 18 degrees and I drill. I'm going to end up with the compound angle that I want. So this is all, a lot of the chair building is done, you know, on the drawing board and you figure all this stuff out in advance. Um, so when I uh, drill my holes, and I'm not going to drill a hole, but I, I use a 5 8 bit, which is a little bigger than this, and I use a bit brace. And this is typically up on the bench, all right? And again, I'm lining my bit up right with this line. I usually put a square right here that helps me line things up, and off I go, and I, I, I drill my four holes. Um, I like using a bit and a brace like this because once I start, I get in there a little bit, a little deeper than that. It'll stay in position. I can get back from across the room. I can look at it. Am I really lined up well? I think I am. I think I am here when I'm looking over it, but when I get from, look from back there, I find out, no, I'm really not lined up well, and I need to make adjustments. So when I'm drilling a chair leg, it might take me six or seven minutes to drill that leg because I'm, I'm taking a few turns. I'm going back and checking. A few turns, going back and checking because it's really important that I get the right compound angle or this chair is not going to either look right or work well. Um, so I spend a lot of time drilling the holes as accurately as I can and there's a lot of control with um, you know this type of tool. And these tools are available everywhere. You go to a flea market, I go to the Hubbardston flea market, I mean you can you could probably under ten dollars you can get a, a, a good uh, brace and bits you know probably paid a dollar for that. Once my holes are done, I begin to sculpt the seat. And when I sculpt the seat, I start with something called an adz. And um, I literally just stand over the chair like this and I start chopping. And um, I just, you know, two things I have to really be careful of that I don't put a chop outside that line right there because this is, uh, this is an area where we're not going to sculpt. I have to be very careful that I don't chop too close to that. 
So I try to keep my chopping, you know, in this area here. And the other thing I don't want to do is put the ads into my foot or my toe. Um, I've, come, I've come close, uh, but I have yet to actually cut myself. But you can imagine um, me standing over this and chopping what it looks like. It looks terrible. I mean, I'm, I'm hacking out the wood. It's, there's nothing neat and clean about it at all. But what it allows me to do, it allows me to remove a lot of wood relatively quickly. And that's important. Once I have the, the, the chair hogged out with the ads, and again, this is typically at, at, at this point when I'm using my, the next tool, which is a scorp. This is up on my bench. Um, I'm able to really smooth out and to be, begin to refine uh, the shape of that seat with this tool right here. This tool is best used, it's, think of it as a draw knife that's just sort of bent in a circle. Um, they're called scorps, some people call it an, an, an in shave. But when this is dragged across the wood or pulled across the wood diagonally to the grain, it, it cuts beautifully and it, it removes a lot of wood quickly. Um, and I can, I can then begin to cut very close to my finish line um, and really smooth out this seat. It's not as smooth as I need it to be, but the scorp takes a lot of wood down and really starts making it look like a, a chair seat. After, go ahead. Have you cut it out? Nope. I, I still, I, I leave it. I cut it out at the last possible point. I used to cut them out. I'm glad you asked the question because it speaks to me changing my technique as, as my experience grew. Um, now I leave it uh, full size to the last possible minute. I want as much wood on there as possible because it's easier for me to clamp it, number one. Um, and it just, it just works out better. I used to sculpt the seats first and then drill my holes. I no longer do that. I haven't done that for the last few dozen chairs. I, I drill my holes when everything is, is flat. It's just, again, it's much easier. I don't know why. I know why, because it was that book I bought that I talked about earlier. That initial book, he sculpted the seat first and drilled the holes. Second, that's why I did it for so many years. And it, you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, how are you, you going to take a bevel square and put it on a thing that's all sculpted out? Uh, I don't know how I did it. Um, so once I'm done with my scorp, I typically use a compass plane. Um, a plane maker in uh, Maine sold me this. It's a nice little tool. Just has a radius here um, and, you know, regular plain iron. And, again, uh, just planting like you're planting a, a regular piece of wood, uh, it does a nice job. It doesn't make the chair seat really uh, smooth, but what it does is it refines all the, all the uh, tool marks that the scorp left. This takes care of those. So we're getting there. Every step we're getting closer and closer. So finally, I work over the chair seat with another tool called the Travisher. Uh, again, it's a bent, it's a bent uh, sole, it's a bent uh, iron, and um, I'll talk about sharpening down the road here, but uh, I keep all my tools very, very sharp, and you're able to get a, a practically a finished uh, look after using the Travisher. All these things obviously take time. We're going from the ads, very rough, down to very, very refined with the Travisher. So I'll spend, you know, several hours on a chair seat uh, if I start at 8 o'clock in the morning, I probably have everything done the way I want it around noontime. Um, how long does a whole chair take? Quick. It's really hard for me to say how long a, a chair takes because of we, we've got to let things dry and days go by. So um, when I teach, though, what I try to do is we try to build a chair in, in six days. You know, and that's with a student doing the work. Now, in that case, too, it, that's not a great measurement either because I've done the turning for the student. I've done the turning because um, that's a whole other, like, you know, thing you've got to learn. Uh, and we, do, we do, don't have time. 
Uh, but, you know, for me to build a chair, I, you know, a very full week, I could, I could build the chair. Um, but I'm always satisfied when the chair's done. You know, if I start it, you know, Sunday night or something, Friday night I'm probably done, Saturday morning. Uh, but then I have to finish it, you know, with, with either milk paint or some kind of finish. And that, it's, it's amazing how long that takes. It's not like building another chair, but it takes me days to finish a chair. So, okay. So, seats. We've gone from the ads to the traverser. We're, we're, we're just about done. Um, what else can I tell you in terms of the construction before I go on to other aspects? Um, you'll notice on some of the chairs that we've got carvings, uh, like on this uh, comb back. I've got ears carved here. I have knuckles carved here. Um, you should know that the knuckles, it's not, it's not efficient and it's really wasteful for me to build this arm out of a single piece of wood. It's a single piece of wood all except the bottom probably three-eighths of an inch on this knuckle. The top is all the same but I've applied, I've glued face to face about three-eighths of an inch to build up the thickness that I need to carve the knuckle. Um, and, and that's how it was done quite often in, in, in earlier times as well. Do you glue first or carve first? No, glue first. Glue first. Uh, and if a glue joint is done, if a glue joint is done properly, it's always stronger than, than, than wood itself. Um, what I don't like to do, I, and, and again, I've done this in the past, is I don't like to add wood this way. Um, I used to, here's a great example, the sack back chair. I used to build all my sack back chairs. Think of this dimension right here coming down the arm, straight down right here, right? Very easy to make, very easy to bend, and then I would glue on, I'd add a piece onto this to get the width that I wanted here. So you have a glue joint right here. And I've got a bunch of chairs in the house that have got glue joints right there. Um, we use them all the time. They haven't broken because again if done right the glue joint should be stronger than the wood itself but it's a whole nother step in the process and that's what I don't like I don't need any more steps so um, for the last several years all of my chairs I don't glue anything other than if I'm going to add thickness here so this is all this is all solid one piece of wood and we're going to bend a chair back actually for that style chair um, and you'll see it's, it's, you know, it's very enlarged. It's, it's, it's a lot more wood than I need. Um, in terms of the carving, like up on the ears, I carve, initially I did not. And again, through experience, um, I've changed things. I used to rough carve this out, very, very rough, bend it, and then do my finished carving. But <clears throat> I don't do that anymore. I, this is rough carve now. I need to finish carve it, just refine it a bit, um, put it into the steam box, and then bend it. Um, and I, re I do that because, you know, I rough carved it before. I would bend it. Now I have this round wood. How am I holding that still? And I'm trying to do my finished carving. It, that was a nightmare, too. So, again, just through experience, I've learned to change my techniques or adapt my techniques. So I always carve first um, and then do my bending. Um, okay, I just want to check my time. All right, we've got about 10 more minutes before we're going to bend. So I, I want to talk a little bit about this chair again. This chair is um, not a Windsor chair. The legs and the back are the same piece of wood. But a lot of the techniques that we use for Windsor chair building, we're going to use in this type of construction too. So all the rungs, all the rungs, are, well, all the parts are split from a log with using the fro um, and shaven with a draw knife, um, finished with a spoke shave. And <clears throat> I was telling Tom earlier, all my rungs, just like the chair legs on the Windsor chair, are super dry. These are super dry. Not only are they super dry, 
um, the tenons, which go into this piece here, one inch, the tenons are about ten thousandths of an inch bigger than they need to be. I'm going to be boring a five-eighths hole, so I've got um, my tenons, which point two six to five, that's five-eighths, but plus another ten thousandths. So I, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm forcing a very dry tenon, an oversized but dry tenon, into a piece of wood that has significant moisture content. And I'm able to do that because with that moisture content, it, it absorbs it. You know, it's not, if it was dry, it would just split. But it, it, it takes it um, and it expands on the inside. But as it dries, it's going to shrink around the rungs and, and make these rungs very, very difficult to come out. And I was also saying earlier how the holes on the front of this chair, I do the sides first. Then I drill the holes in the front. And this hole actually cuts away a little bit of that tenon. So I have this hole, it's a little bit, it's about an eighth of an inch cutting away the end of that tenon. So what it ends up doing is it, it creates a lock. So this tenon here is now locked in by this tenon and it, it, it can't come out. So again, it's the same type of principle where we're following the grain. We don't want any grain run out. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it, it's going to end up making a very, very strong chair. I wanted to say that too. The chairs have a lot of hardwood in them, but the chairs are very, very, considering hardwood, the chairs are very light. I mean, take a contemporary Windsor chair today. You're not going to be able to hold it out one hand. Um, so it's a light, strong chair, um, all of them. And it's really because we're starting from the log, we're splitting, we're following the grain, um, and it makes some really great, great furniture. The other thing about this type of construction that I like, um, other than when I'm sanding, I try not to sand pots, but when I'm on the lathe, I do some finished sanding. Other than that, I don't have any sawdust in the shop. I really don't like, you know, it's in my nose. I don't like sawdust. I don't mind shavings. I can just sweep it up. But sawdust, I don't like. The other thing I try to avoid, um, the reason I try to avoid sanding is because I'm going to be finishing my chairs most often with milk paint, which is a water-based paint. Um, and if I have an area that's sanded, if I sand all this, and then I put water-based paint over this, the grain is just going to raise, rise, uh, and it's going to be kind of fuzzy. Now I've got to sand that down. I have to put on another coat. It's going to rise a little more. I've got to sand that down. It just makes it, um, again, more work. And the other thing for my, myself, I like to see and feel tool marks on my chairs. Uh, I'll show you that in, in, in a minute. But milk paint. Milk paint comes in a powdered form. Um, this is how I use it. There's two companies that I use. One's called the Real Milk Paint Company. I think it's in Tennessee. Um, this uh, company is in Groton, Mass. So I, I like going there and seeing what they have new, and I, I buy it there. But it's, it's powdered uh, paint. You mix it with water. You can mess around with the consistency. Um, do you want it you know, more like cream, or do you want it more like, you know, uh, skim milk, what do you want it like? Um, and it, it really, it makes a difference. Um, the thinner it is, obviously, the more coats of paint you need to put on. I always have multiple coats of paint on the chairs. Um, quite often I have, you know, one color on this particular chair. There was like a mustard color that the, the chair was painted. A couple of coats of that. And then layers of very, very thin black paint to go over that. Um, through use, um, you know, the paint will get worn, uh, and I really like to see that, that worn look to the paint. It's just, I, I like it. My, uh, my wife was telling me that <coughs> I've got three daughters, and I've, I've, I've told them all, and be careful what you tell your kids, because I told them all, you know, when you have your own houses, this is years ago, if you have your own houses, I'll make you, you know, dining room table and chairs. Well, two of them bought houses. Dad, you said this, so I've made, uh, I've made a lot of chairs for my family. 
and my youngest daughter hasn't bought the house yet, but it's coming close. But again, I don't know. I'm hoping that you can see this. I really like seeing tool marks wherever I can. Uh, and this is, a chair is a good example. I'll try to get it in the right light for everybody. But I have a, a smooth seat. And again, I, although I don't like the sand, sometimes I have to sand. I scrape and I sand. But, so I've got a smooth seat. But you can see on the front of that chair, I'm hoping you can see those tool marks. Oh, yeah. I like the contrast. Um, I like, you know, I'm sitting in the chair and I'm feeling the tool marks. I just think that's so cool. Years ago, that first chair that I, I built, I sanded all my spindles. I don't sand spindles anymore, ever, ever, ever. Um, I really, we really haven't talked about spoke shaves, but this is a spoke shave. And, um, you know, when I'm when I'm working on spindles, I do a lot of draw knife in first to get the spindle to the shape that I want, the rough shape that I want, and then I typically dry it. Um, I typically dry it because once it's dry, the wood becomes hotter and it, it will shave with the spoke shave very, very nicely. And, you know, again, through experience, I can tell a sharp tool from a tool that's not sharp. And if you just listen, let me set that a little deeper. I mean, that, that tool is just, it's just slicing through the, through the, uh, through the grain. And you, I mean, you can tell by the shavings, too. That's a very sharp tool and it's going to leave a very, very nice finish. Um, and over, you know, taking your time, um, you'll have something that looks round from a distance, but when you go up and feel it, you can feel all the little facets. And again, it's just a, a part of the chair making that, that I really appreciate and I, I like, and it's, it's what I strive to do. Okay. I think it's time for us to go try to bend a piece of wood here. And so what we're doing is I've got a piece for a sack back chair. And again, the hands on the, on the piece that I'm going to take out of the, the uh, steamer aren't going to look like this. They're going to come down and it's just going to be more of, a, of a, more of a rectangle shape. None of the scroll work is done. Um, because on that particular piece, I'm not sure whether I'm going to make a, an arm like this with just the scroll work or will I add, uh, you know, stock to the bottom and carve knuckles? Because I do that quite often in sack back chairs. Mm -hmm. I haven't decided. But let's go back here. Okay, so what I've got going over here is I've got this, we're going to call it a steamer. Um, all it is is a, is a PVC pipe. And um, sealed at both ends. I've got some... Um, some way to let to relieve the pressure so there's at least one pilot hole you can see the steam coming out of there and the only other thing you need is some sort of uh, heating device to provide the steam I mean you could use tea kettles uh, I tried that one time on top of the stove um, you know that didn't work out that well uh, eventually I, I ended up having just like lobster pots and I did it outside propane uh, burners and I did it that way for about 30 years it was only the last several months that I decided to try these electrical things and honestly I was telling Tom earlier I had no faith 70 bucks each I said I'm gonna spend the money but I I don't think this is gonna work well at all I love these they things great. they're yeah. awesome <laughs> you know no more going outside in the freezing cold <laughs> pouring rain you know the wind knocking yeah. out my flame yeah, exactly. it's beautiful but it's not as authentic now yeah I, right yeah, that's no true that's true, you know. Oh yeah. yeah it Did it work? Yeah. Yeah, it oh. a tube yeah excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I like this better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've got a, I've got a, a piece in there, and that piece is probably eleven sixteenths thick. So a good rule of thumb is anything about an inch thick, give it an hour to an hour and fifteen minutes. Um, I always steam my pieces for about fifteen minutes to an hour. Even if I'm going a little over, I'm not worried about, I'm not going to like overcook the wood. 
Um, the wood is, the woods are, it's full of moisture, <laughs> right? It's green. Now, it doesn't always have to be green. You could, um, you could have a dry piece of wood, um, and if I was doing that, I'd probably just steam it a little longer. You may reduce your success rate by having a dry piece of wood, um, but it's certainly, certainly able to bend uh, wood, you know, that you buy at, you know, a piece of oak from Home Depot. If you find something with some pretty decent grain, you, you could probably do that. But going from a log, and again, following the grain, which is critical <coughs> to the bend that we're going to make, that is really the key. Still, doing that, there's no, it's not 100% guaranteed that this is, is going to work. So I always tell people that. I don't, like, don't want to disappoint anybody, but I, I will say, if you uh, know any wood bending prayers, now's a good time to say it because. <laughs> Two, basically, teapots yep. that are boiling water at 212 degrees. Yep. You're losing little degrees when you, yep. because of the hose length. Right. But it stays pretty. Yeah, and I've measured it. I, 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 I've been at 210, 211. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's hot. So about an hour? Or a For, if it was an inch thick, this is, a, this is about 11 sixteenths thick. So I, I, it's been in plenty of time. It's been in almost an hour now. Um, so I, I know we've got enough time there. Yeah. So if this, if this does not w work, if this has a fracture, and what the fracture is going to be, just let me grab something from up here. This, the, what the fracture is going to be, it's going to be this. Because again, if you, think of, if you think of the wood, and when I talk about following the grain, um, it's looking this way. And these are those annual rings running the long way, right? If I, have, if, if I haven't run, if I haven't severed anything, the, this is all one layer of grain. And when I bend, I'm probably going to have a, a very good chance of it being successful. If I sever the grain like I showed you, Right? And it does this, when we try to bend, what's going to happen is it's going to do this. And it's going to look just like that. Right? Might, maybe not that long, but that's exactly what happens. So sometimes if I get a little fracture like that, I can grab it. Maybe I put a tack in it. I can put some glue in there later, but I hate doing that. I want, I want a perfect bend. That's the goal. Uh, I don't want to repair stuff. Now, I, br I bring this net. Because just the fishing that, that I was making a bunch last spring. It's got, this is ash, the lighter wood's ash, the, the darker wood is cherry. And I bring this because this was, it was kiln dried wood. The grain wasn't perfect grain. Um, and it was, I sawed it on the table saw. I just sawed up strips. So I know that I've severed the grain. <laughs> but the reason this has been, and it's been successful is because we're only talking a couple layers of grain here. We're not talking a lot of wood. If I, if I tried to do this with a piece of cherry that was, you know, this thick, not going to work. But because this was so thin, um, I was able to get away with it even if I severed the grain. And, and this was dry too. But again, it's all because it was just it's so thin. Go to thicker wood, a lot more trouble. Yeah. Is that for like catching fish? Yeah. Yeah. For kids? Um, no, for me, I fly fish a lot, so this this would be a net. I I, I got to drill a bunch of holes, and you weave your net in there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're gonna take this out. Now ash wood is kind of hard to find these days, right? Yeah, because a lot of the it's trees. Easy. Yep. Yep. I really bang this in typically, but my hammer's up there. <laughs> I'm okay. All right. So. Yep, thank you. Okay, now we don't have a lot of time to do this. I'm going to leave that there. This is typically when we have trouble because this is cooler now than this side. And what I'm doing, I mean, you can hear it. What I'm doing is I'm compressing. I'm compressing the, no, the inside of that curve. This is getting compressed. This is getting this tension, this huge tension out here. And I'm stretching this. This is why it's so critical that we, when we shave, when I shave this surface, you really have got to avoid severing the grain. Because if you don't, you're going to get just what I showed. That's, it's going to lift up and it's going to just run. 
So what I typically do um, at this point is I want to get a wedge in here to finish off the curve. Okay. And the other thing that I like to do, because I want, I know this is going to be the top of the seat yeah. or the top of the arm. Um, I've made this as smooth as I can just in case I glue um, to add some thickness for my knuckles. So, and I haven't done that up here. So I want my chairs, I don't want my chairs flat and I definitely don't want them to turn in like that. I want the handles to turn out just a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll just put a little wedge on this side and this is probably up now a sixteenth of an inch maybe on one side, same thing here, just enough to give it what I want. Um, you know, do I have to do that? No, I don't. Could I do it later? I could. I could take a heat gun, or, you know, put it over the, you, you know, your charcoal burner. I could heat this later and, and manipulate this, um, and I've done that. Um, but if I can do it now and I don't have to worry about it later, I, I like to do it now. So, thank you for the prayers because um, it worked. So you can see, so here's a good example right here. I'm hoping you can see that right there. You see that grain? Um, it's one color here and another color right there. Yeah. I, I inadvertently severed slightly right there. And a little bit here, you know. But overall, it's not bad. And you know, you can just look right here. I mean, this is pretty vivid. You can see the grain lines going parallel right to the edge. And that's what you're looking for. It's when, you know, that, that piece I showed where you had the run out. If this grain's running out like right here and just running out, again, that's when you're gonna have trouble. So by shaving the pieces, uh, splitting them and shaving them and following the grain, you reduce the possibility of um, the piece fracturing when you bend it. No guarantees, but I'm going to say the last hundred pieces of wood that I've tried to bend, it's probably 98 or 99 successes. So it's, you know, I'm going to have a problem. It's just a matter of time that you're going to have a problem. But in, because sometimes there's things inside that wood, the structure of the wood, the, the cell makeup or whatever, that isn't going to allow it to bend, you know. Um, this tree, you know, I purchased this log probably a month ago, and it was probably cut within a month of me purchasing it. So this is relatively fresh. I'm going to call it freshly cut. Um, I've got some oak in the yard that's been there three years probably. It's split. It's split into, you know, workable sections, but I haven't used it yet. It's all gray, and it doesn't, it doesn't look very good. But as soon as I put the fro on it and I split it, it's going to look like brand new, fresh wood because oak takes a while to dry out. And, um, and I can still use it and, and, and not worry too much about having a problem when I bend. I, I'd rather have a fresher piece of wood, but I can use oak that's been around for a few years. A few years, I would say two to three years. I wouldn't go any further than that. You know? So now, this is a couple things that are important here. I always take this out because... This sitting in that steamer softened the wood. It almost made it, some people call it plasticizing the wood. It's almost like plastic, right? So it's soft. So if I leave this in, by the time I get home, if I took it out when I get home, I would have a flat spot right there from that wedge. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I could deal with that, but I don't want to have to deal with that. Um, take it out now and avoid having the flat spot. When I get home, I'll take just tight bond glue and I'll just, you know, my finger, I'll just smear the end, both of them. And I do that because this is end grain. This is going to seal up the end of this piece of wood um, and it's going to dry slower. If moisture starts to escape this piece of wood too quickly, we're going to get something called a check. A check is a split. My finish length is going to be overall 46 inches I've got it marked here I've added another I don't know inch inch and a quarter there just in case I have some kind of checks they're not going to interfere with my finished piece but again I want to avoid all problems so I'm, the glue 
will help to slow the drying down um, so that it dries slowly and will not, will not check. So eventually, this is going to go into my kiln at 130 degrees. If I just took this home today and put it in the kiln, guaranteed it's going to be checked. And the checks could run way up in here at, at, that, at that extreme temperature. Um, I will put this probably in the garage today. Probably tomorrow I'll move it into my cellar uh, where the cellar is warm but away from the furnace. And I'll leave it there for a few days. After a few days, I'll put it closer to the furnace. And I always stand it up. Um, I always stand it up like this. Okay. I stand it up like this. Here's my furnace. Um, and I know this is done. I know it's dry when my wedges fall out. Okay. So because what's happening is this is drying. And as it dries, it's going to shrink. You know, these are put in with a fair enough force where when they fall out, this is dry considerably. And at that point, you know, I don't have to wait that long, frankly, to put it into the kiln. Uh, but once the wedges do fall out, um, that's when I typically put it into the kiln. And that just, you know, makes it the final the final step. But I don't have to, at that point, I don't have to worry about anything, anything checking or anything. I, I know I'm going to be good. Um, it gets stained, you know, from sitting in there. It, it sat on a couple of cross pieces that were wood. So this gets stained, no problem. Everything's going to get shaved off. I'm going to, I'm going to plane this down. It's probably, you know, a 32nd, maybe a 16th thicker than what I'm going to want. I'm going to plane this all down. Um, with you know a hand plane later and clean it all up once it's totally dry. So, so that's a big piece of the Windsor chair uh, construction right there, and it, we were lucky. I'm just going to unplug these and then we can talk. There's a few more things that I want to go over. I want to talk a little bit about sharpening. Um, <coughs> Because, again, it's a critical, critical step. I, I have found that people that, you know, take a hand plane and they, they're fighting with it and, you know, they end up not liking woodworking. That's their first experience of woodworking, taking a hand plane and trying to plane something. And, and it doesn't work out well. And then because of that experience, they don't want to be continue trying woodworking. Almost always it's because the plane is not tuned. If you tune a plane, you've got a flat sole, you have a very sharp plane iron. Planing is, it's a joy and it's very, very easy to do. And so most often it, the problems come down to um, not having a sharp edge. So um, this, I, I'll just tell you, this little draw knife, and I take this one because it's a six inch knife. Um, and I, I got a bunch of stuff and this is just, it just fits. I've got knives that are eight, 10, 12 inches long. A bigger knife allows me to, you know, hog off some more wood um, and not with, with a lot of effort. I need a little more effort with a smaller knife unless I'm just taking some really fine cuts. But I bring this one because it's small and because I was at my father-in-law's house and we were cleaning out the cellar. And I look up in the rafters and there's this draw knife sitting up there. It's got a handle, a broken handle on one side, no handle on the other side, and it's all rust and, you know, it probably had been there for 50 years. Um, so I took it home, you know, several hours of cleaning it up, uh, cleaning it up. Uh, I usually start with rough sandpaper, really work on the areas. I, I, it was all pitted. I tried to get it. Uh, rid of most of the pitting. I turned some new handles um, and then I finally put on an edge. But at no point did I grind the draw knife. So I try not to grind any of my edge tools at all. And if I do have to grind, and when I'm saying grinding, I'm talking about a grinder, a bench grinder. Uh, if I do have to grind, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to grind with like a water-cooled grinder where, where the grinding stone is running through a bath of, of water to keep the stone and to keep the tool cool. Because if the tool gets too hot, and that's typically what happens with people grinding on their bench grinders, is they take the temper out of the steel. And that's going to affect 
how well you're going to be able to sharpen it and how long that edge is going to last. So I, I again, I don't want to have to deal with a problem and I try to avoid it by not grinding and just taking more time um, by other methods. So the methods that I use to sharpen tools, um, they're not new methods, certainly. This, these are, this is a, a stone. I've got a bunch of different oil stones. This stone happens to have a rougher surface and a smoother surface. Um, so I use stones a lot. Um, oil stones. There's also water stones. I really like water stones. But after I um, use a stone for a long period of time, the stone will get dished. And now I've got to, it's more maintenance. I, I can flatten that stone again. Um, but it, again, it's a, it's a step that I can take to fix something, but I don't want to have to do it. So about 20 years ago, I started um, using something like this, just a couple pieces of plywood. I get glass um, epoxied to the plywood. And what I do is I just go to the automotive shop uh, or the automotive store, and I buy um, sandpaper. So I buy sandpaper. I usually start around 600 grit for my, my finished um, sharpening 600 and I go up to 3,000 so the paper this is made for about the same size of the paper I just lay one piece of the paper down a little water holds it in place and I'm able to sharpen my edge tools um, you know I'll do 600 800 go up to 1200 and all the way up to, to 3,000 um, I've been using this thing for you know over 20 years there's no there's nothing dished on this it's flat uh, and it does a fantastic job so if you haven't tried sandpaper on glass, um, it, it's, it's something to try. Um, I'm, I just lost my train of thought because there was one other thing I was going to say about sharpening. Hopefully it's going to come back to me. Um, just like I found this in my uh, father-in-law's cellar, um, I have found other tools um, I, I do want to show you one tool that I didn't put out because this was really a, a, a special tool to me. This is a crooked knife. And um, this is, I, I believe, crooked knives originated from Native Americans. Uh, because a lot of the same process that we're doing for chairs, Native Americans did for bows, especially Native Americans in this part of the country. Um, because all their bows here were wood bows, where other parts of the country there were other materials. Um, and Inuits, um, or you know, northern uh, tribes, um, used a lot of this for canoes. And it's the same type of thing, splitting up wood, shaving it. So I decided I was going to make a crooked knife because I thought it had application to chair building. So what this knife is, is uh, it, this is just a file. I had a small file. Literally built the fire in the backyard, threw the file in the fire, the file became cherry red. Files are very brittle, but once it becomes cherry red, I'm able to um, bend it without it breaking. If I tried to bend just a, a file out of the toolbox, it's certainly going to break. Um, so I bent it, put a little, um, you know, bevel on it, um, then tempered it, and I was able to sharpen it. And it's a very, very nice knife. Uh, when I was younger and I was stronger, this was uh, better for me to use. But it takes, because it's one hand, it takes more force for me to do things. Um, so I used to shave a lot of my spindles with the crooked knife. Um, but again, I don't, I just, I don't have the strength that I used to have. And it's just easier for me to put it into the, uh, the shaving horse. And the shaving horse has been a big um, help for me. Uh, I've been building chairs, you know, first one for my wife, so we've been married 35 years. So I've been building them for 35 years, and I haven't, I've only used a shaving horse probably the last two years. Up until then, everything I did, because it goes right back to the same book that I keep referring to, that's what the guy did. He put it in his vise at the workbench, and he did all his work there, and that's what I did. Uh, once I built the shaving horse, and I sat down, as, as opposed to standing at that bench for hours are you kidding me this was like so nice is this your design uh no this is somebody else's design there's lots of designs out there though online you can find all kinds of different designs this i built this one 
because it was going to be, you know, I've got these teeth in here, so it's adjustable for different thicknesses. But there's other ways, there's um, much easier ways to make an adjustable shaving horse uh, for any size piece other than that. I, next one, I'm not doing that, you know. But there's all kinds of designs online, all kinds of stuff. But, and it's really, I mean, to me, I, I absolutely recommend if you, if you think you're going to do any green woodwork and um, don't stand at that, at that vice. <laughs> this, is, this is so much nicer. Um, I'll answer any questions. I, I do want to let you know that I've got some contact information on the back table there. Um, I do uh, teach uh, classes. I do sell chairs uh, and benches. Um, but, you know, you typically have to get in line because my wife's got stuff that, <laughs> and my daughters, you know. I, ha I got to tell you my, my, well, two stories about the girls. My wife was with my oldest daughter the other day um, down in Connecticut, and, she's, and my daughter said, Mom, the chairs, um, I don't, it, it, they're, they're bow back chairs. I don't have one here. But the top, the paint was wearing through. And she is Dad going to be mad the paint's wearing through? And because um, I layer, again, I layer the paint. When I see paint wearing through a chair, it means the chair is getting used. That, how, that honors me. You're going to use my chair so much that you're going to wear the paint through? That's awesome. You know? So my middle daughter, she wanted, I made, she got two like this and four fan back chairs. And um, she wanted a color scheme that I've never done. So, uh, I did all the chairs, and honestly, I hated them. Uh, they looked very, the color wasn't the issue, the finish was the issue. Um, and they looked plastic. They looked like, uh, it, was just, it was just bad. And, and she didn't like it either. So I ended up stripping the chairs. I called all over looking for someone to strip the chairs. Nobody would touch it because it's milk paint. And milk paint is very, very uh, tough to strip. So I stripped them all by hand, did them all over again. Guess what? <laughs> yeah. And this is the only time I've ever stripped one of my chairs. So I stripped her chairs two different times. <laughs> but they're beautiful now, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> what was wrong with the second time around? Um, the color was just... It was, it was off, and I followed, you know, my instincts, not her instincts, and I really should have followed her instincts, so it was, uh, it's the only time I've ever done that. I'm never doing it again. It would have been faster for me to pitch them and make new chairs. Oh really? I mean, it would have been faster. What did you use to strip them? Just gel, you know, hardware store stripper, but nasty stuff, you know, nasty stuff. Oh, awful. Do, do people tend to want a certain color, or do some people want to see the grain of the wood? Um, if they're going to see the grain of the wood, it's, it really needs to be a stain um, or, or, or a dye. You might be able to get away with some of the dyes. The first chair that I del built um, for my wife, I did stain that. That was an oil-based stain. But I got away from that because, again, I'm using three different species of wood, and, and stain, you know, it's going to go on pine one way, oak another way, maple another way. So, and what I don't want, when I look at the chairs, I like to see the, what I call the lines of the chairs. That's what I'm looking at. Uh, that's the first thing that I look at, regardless of the color. I want to see the lines of the chair. Um, and if it's stained, because especially the oak has a lot a strong grain, you're distracted. At least I'm distracted. And I'm looking more at the grain than the lines of the chair. So the milk paint, a single color, helps to tie the three species of wood together. So I didn't talk about what I put on over the milk paint. Once I put milk paint on um, and it dries, again, I'm rubbing it down. So I'm probably painting the chair five or six times. Um, and it doesn't, they never look good. Milk paint dries dead, dead flat. Um, and when you rub it down, it's just that much flatter. But then I... We'll put on linseed oil um, or like a, uh, why can't I not think of the name? 
Danish uh, Watco oil. As soon as I put something like that onto the milk paint, it, it changes the color immediately, and it, 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 look, it looks really, it looks nice. Um, so there's not, somebody asked, you asked myself, I think, about uh, is there one color more than another. What a lot of people like will be like a Bond red. It's a, it's, it's a deep red um, underneath black. So if I'm able to thin the black down enough, uh, and I've been successful at this a couple of different times, um, it, the finished chair almost looks like a stained chair without seeing all the wild grain, you know. And I really like that. So it's, all, it's a matter of manipulating the paint, um, layering the paint. Um, I'm now keeping sort of records of my stuff. Um, it actually, my daughter Kara, when I, you know, had to strip those chairs. She said, Dad, you need to, you need to record what you're doing so you don't make mistakes. Wow. She gave me a little pad, so that's what I'm using now. <laughs> um, so I, I'm keeping records so that I can reproduce different colors and, and different schemes. Because that's really important if you're making a set of chairs for somebody. They all better look alike. I mean, the black is very classic. Yeah. I see a lot of that. Yeah. If you have a lot of different woods and different furniture, even if you paint everything black, it kind of... It all yeah. together, that's another. And I've read a lot of the early early chairs were outside chairs. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They weren't necessarily made for inside, they were outside chairs. And, all, and a lot of them were painted with, you know, they used like lead, they had lead paint. Um, a lot of them painted with lead paint. After they put mercury um, on their faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, a question about these two chairs. Yeah. One of them has is a little more complicated, so that one's simpler. Is, is this one stronger because it has another? Uh, are you comparing these two? No, the, the green, green one the green and then the one black. on the other side. Okay. So there's, so that one has like a line in the middle of the back. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, so the arm in the back is probably providing a little more support uh, for those spindles, because this, this has no arm, uh, you know, the, the, it's a different kind of arm. Um, so the spindles on that chair are slightly larger. Oh, so that, that's continuous, that's right, yeah. you said that. Yeah. This must be much harder to make, though, I imagine. Because um, you have to get the... In terms of putting it together, yeah. this one is more challenging. That's the most challenging bend that, I'm, that I do. Yeah. That's a very challenging bend. Uh, because you're bending, you know, you're bending kind of two dimensions, exactly. The bent that we made is this, but then the form would have, you know, it's, it's bent like that. So the form has two sides that go down. And right here, it's relieved here to make this bend easier. Uh, but if it's going to break, and I have broken plenty, um, and when I say break, I get the grain coming up. It's right here. So this is the most challenging bend. In terms of assembling, this chair is probably um, the most challenging. Um, I didn't mention this because um, we've been all over the place in my conversation here, but the spindles, this spindle starts here, ends here. All right, so that's one spindle goes through the arm and, and through the bow. And, and you know, when we're constructing the chair, the spindles are all up you know, this high. And, after everything's done, I cut the spindle to about a quarter of an inch, split that spindle with, my, um, with a chisel, and I drive a wedge in there. So all these spindles are wedged, just like the wedge that I, I showed on the, uh, on the chair seat. So wherever I can wedge a joint, almost all the joints are through mortise joints, um, wherever I can wedge a joint, I do. So this is wedged, this is wedged, this, this right here is wedged underneath. And this is where it is very difficult for me to get my chisel underneath there to split that. Very difficult to get a wedge in there and to hit it with a hammer because everything's in the way. So I, I don't know how to avoid that. I, I've, I've thought about let's put this piece on, on the arm, and then put it together. I don't know if, because I could do that. If I'm just putting this arm, uh, the bow in place, I could wedge this before it's assembled, and now I'm assembling this and this together. 
I haven't done it. I've thought about it. Um, maybe I'll try it, you know. Because driving those wedges is very difficult. What's the difference in what they're called, these two? I mean, all three are Windsor chairs. Right. right? These two. This what? is sack back. Sack back, and that's just a Windsor chair? Um, the continuous arm, and this is a comb back or a Philadelphia high back chair. And, and, you know, there's variations in all the styles. Like I said, this could have knuckles. Uh, they all could have rockers. Um, you know, they make this chair. This chair is made, a tr they call it a triple back, where probably four spindles would come up even higher. And now there's another piece more like uh, uh, the comb back. Yeah, you those know. are ugly, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, some people like them. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of them, but... Um, there's all kinds of variations. And then I know with um, dressers like high boys, the, um, the legs will tell you where it's made. So like the ball and claw is Boston, whereas like a simpler one would be Connecticut. Right, right. Do people do that with the chairs yeah. as well so sometimes? I, I'm not, you know, I don't at all claim to be a historian. I've, I've read about different chair makers um, and definitely, you know, um, people that have really uh, that really know their Windsor chairs can tell you by looking at the leg that's a Rhode Island chair, that chair is made in Connecticut, that chair is Boston, that chair is Philadelphia. And it's, it's a lot of it's around what the turnings look like. So I don't try to... You're not making reproductions per se. You're just making the... No, yeah. 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 I, I make a leg that I like. You know? Uh, frankly, the, the, chair, the legs that are in Rhode Island, Rhode Island legs, they're, they don't have, I like this taper going from this dimension down to the smallest dimension I can get here because I just think it looks cool to me. Um, Rhode Island chair doesn't have that sharp taper that I'm trying to achieve, you know. And that's why I really don't, I don't like those legs because I want that taper. But again, you know, the first chair that I made, the leg really didn't look much like that at all, you know. But I, I've changed over over years. So again, I don't expect you to go home and be able to build a Windsor chair necessarily. But there are books, and, and on, on my contact stuff, I've listed books. If you want to learn more about it, there are some good books. The best book is, is a guy, Peter Galbert. He was from Sterling, but now he's... Um, I think he's in Rosendale now, but he is, he is one of the best chair makers that I'm aware of. Uh, really, really, he's really good. I mean, he's, he's an artist, number one, and he's just really good with his hands uh, and, and figuring out all kinds of techniques, um, you know, different techniques, drilling techniques, shaping techniques that, that make the process that much easier. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I hope you, I hope you got some information from it. Thank you. How many Windsor chairs do you have at home? Out of curiosity. Jeez, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I like there's six at the, there's six at the kitchen table. There's six at the dining room table. I got a, I got a room with, at least, uh, another eight. I got some upstairs. They're all over the place. Um, I got one daughter in Colorado, and uh, she, you know, she's asking me the other day, so what are you working on? I said, I told her I was working on a chair. I was working on this chair. Another chair? Because I, like, I got, you know. Yeah, it's really what I do. It's what I, I, I like it. I, I really enjoy it. And I, again, I built a bunch of other things. Um, I built most of the furniture in the house, but I like the chairs. And, um, you know, I've done other things, uh, canoes, kayaks, uh, but all the projects that I build, I, I, I build because um, I like the shape, you know. And a lot of the projects that I built have got to do with bending wood, so because I really enjoy that. I've made, I've made, I don't know, between myself and and things that I did when I was teaching uh, at school, probably 50 pairs of snowshoes. Um, never put a pair on in my life. <laughs> never had a pair on but I built 50 pairs because I just liked, it was a cool process, you know. Sort of like that net. Yeah, oh yeah, 
Yeah, although I do use those a lot. <laughs> this, is, this is cool. Um, um, this chair is assembled and the slats aren't put in. And the slats are not thick at all. They're only 3 sixteenths of an inch. And what I did was I um, milled up my wood, same process though, and, and milled it up um, and then dried them. So they were flat and I put them into that kiln and made them super dry. Because what I didn't want is once I bent them and forced them into the mortises, I didn't want the slat then to dry and shrink because then I've got all these, I got a crack here, you know what I mean? I got, it, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to look like I, I'm a sloppy woodworker. So um, I dried them and um, I forced them into the mortises. But what a wrestling match trying to get these in, um, uh, especially the bottom one. I mean, a real, they only go in three quarters of an inch, but what a wrestling match trying to get them in. Um, but I did it. And, and then once they're in, this piece here is is still relatively wet or green and it continues to shrink and you know where three days ago I had a slight crack I have no crack now and probably when it's dry I'm not gonna have anything so you end up with some really some tight joints